Great, thank you so much, Manuela. So well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are using Zoom webinar today and we do welcome um, your participation. Thank you to everybody who's been uh, writing in the chat their affiliation and where they're joining us from. And as you may see on the bottom of your navigation bar, there is a Q&A function and we invite you to please um, enter your questions in there. There's also the opportunity to um, upvote. Um, if you see a question that someone else has already put into um, that box, um, so uh, we know that which questions are the most um, the most uh, um, salient for the audience, and we will be using that, and we will address questions at um, the end and throughout as well. So please go ahead and use that function. Um, and if you could use that function, uh, if you're not able to access it for some reason, you can also enter into the chat. And I would also mention that uh, closed captions are available. And so you'll click that CC button on the lower navigation bar towards the right, and you can access um, captions and the transcript there. There's also in the chat, um, I see they just put a um, link to the uh, live transcript. All right. Well, we want to welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, um, depending where you're joining us from. And on behalf of the Market Links production team, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. And I'm going to turn it over to our moderator today, which is Paul Hazen, the Executive Director of the U.S. Overseas Cooperative Development Council. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Julie. And uh, let me welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Uh, on behalf of the OCDC and our members to the Market Links webinar, Advancing Localization Through Cooperatives. I wanna thank USAID and Market Links for this opportunity to disseminate information about the impact of cooperatives in advancing localization. We have, a, we have dynamic panelists that I will introduce in just a moment, but first we may have some people with us today that are not familiar with cooperatives. So let me share with you some of the key components of cooperatives. Next slide, yes. Let's start with the types and sectors of cooperatives. As you can see here, there are several different uh, types of cooperatives uh, and various uh, economic sectors that they participate in. But the key to this is the ownership. Who owns the enterprise? Uh, there are cooperatives in every country around the world and they share one of these ownership uh, st structures, producer, consumer, worker, or a combination of those various types of ownership. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at a definition of, of a cooperative. Now this definition has evolved uh, over the decades ever since the first cooperative was formed in 1844, and cooperatives around the world conform to this definition. This, is, this definition uh, is developed by the International Cooperative Alliance. Next slide, please. Cooperatives are organized around seven principles. The principles are a package. You, just, you can't pick and choose which, which of the principles you'd like to follow and still be a cooperative. The cooperative principles are what makes the cooperatives a different type of business. Next slide, please. But the values listed here are, that are embedded in cooperatives are the soul of the business. Next slide, please. So what difference do cooperatives make in the daily lives of the over 1 billion people around the world that are members of cooperatives? Well, OCDC and an international cooperative research group here have recently completed research on this question. And here are some of our findings. We found that on average, cooperative members are better off financially than non-members. We also found that cooperative members have greater trust in community and they have access to improved social support systems. And importantly, women members gain independence from leadership opportunities from cooperative membership. The World Bank estimates that cooperatives benefit 40% of the global population at the local level. 
So how do these three million cooperatives operate? Well, they have some traits to them that are uh, important for localization. They have sustained commitment to communities. They aggregate voice and advocate for the underrepresented. And they mobilize local resources and expertise. Next slide, please. Here are the uh, OCDC members that are committed to supporting local cooperative development around the world. And they are globally recognized for their expertise and experience. The OCDC members are all implementers of a cooperative development program at USAID. Next slide, please. Now on to our panelists. I'm very pleased to introduce today uh, several local cooperative leaders. Uh, first, Hazel May Sastado from the Sorosaurus Ibaba Development Cooperative in the Philippines. Alfred Foss from the Paraguayan Federation of Producer Cooperatives. And Claude, Claude Omer from Chief of Party for Attain, a USAID funded activity implemented by MEDA in Haiti. Now, the, the uh, cooperative development you will hear about today would not be possible without the support of our partner, USAID, and those people representing them in the panel today. And they include Adriana Casati from USAID Paraguay, Marie Renee Ventos from USAID Haiti, and unfortunately, Jay. Iquerez from USAID Philippines is unable to participate uh, in the program. He may be able to join later, but here, these are our panelists uh, for today. So now I'd like to go right into the questions for our panelists and start with the cooperative leaders. We have um, a question for the same question for all three of our cooperative leaders. Uh, and we're going to start with, uh, with Hazel. Tell us a little bit about your background and current role and when you first became familiar with cooperatives or credit unions. Yes, thank you, Paul. And uh, good evening from the Philippines. Good afternoon. Good Good morning to everyone. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share. So I'm Hazel Mesa Stato. I'm currently um, residing in Batangas City, Philippines. I'm the Business Development Manager of Sorosoro Ibaba Development Cooperative or SIDC, SIDC. SIDC is the largest agri-based cooperative in the Philippines. We're a 5.3 billion asset cooperative operating for 53 years. And we are currently offering diversified businesses, products, and services to our more than 56,000 members nationwide. So aside from that, I finished agribusiness manage management from the University of the Philippines, Las Banas, and currently taking up my master's. I'm also um, familiar with cooperatives ever since I was in high school, since my father is a cooperative member, and I was also a scholar of a cooperative. And during my college years, I was able to go through in-depth um, appreciation of cooperatives by studying the climate variability effects uh, to the hog value chain uh, of, of, uh, of a cooperative. Um, I was luck fortunate enough to be guided by my advisor during that time, Dr. Dina Depositorio. And so my interest for cooperatives uh, have since um, developed during that time. So immediately after graduation, I joined the cooperative and this is SIDSI where I am now. So I've been with the cooperative for more than six years and I'm currently working with cooperatives under the business development, working with primary cooperatives, secondary cooperatives, and um, exploring new business models to, uh, to, in, to engage more farming communities, especially here in the Philippines. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Well, that's an incredible uh, story you have to tell there. And it sounds like you have cooperatives in your DNA. Uh, you learned from your father. So thank you very much. 
Uh, Alfred, the same question to you. Tell us about a little bit about your background and your current role. Yeah, hello to everyone. I'm Alfred Fast. I was born in uh, a Mennonite colony in Paraguay, where the cooperative values uh, were a central part in the daily together, logically with its lights and shadows. My father was involved in our cooperative as a pioneer member. Our cooperative uh, this year has 75 years. And later as president, he was uh, 13 years. I grew up in the countryside. We raised beef cattle. And after finishing high school, I studied agriculture in the National University uh, of Asuncion, obtaining my degree in 1990. Uh, once finished, I helped my father on the ranch, but worked part time in projects with small, medium, and big scale farmers as staff of the Friesland Cooperative in the Department of San Pedro. At the same time, I was teaching beef cattle production in university in Asuncion for 12 years. Uh, from 2006 to 2020, I integrated the board of uh, Cooperativa Friesland six years as uh, president. In these years, we were working together as cooperative uh, with the FECOPROT, our federation. And uh, since 2016, I am a board member in the FECOPROT where uh, last year I accepted to be president. We integrate about 34 production cooperatives with about 170,000 members total and about 30,000 farmers. As federation, our mission is to first defend uh, our members and production system at national level. Uh, second, to improve the competitiveness of our members. Uh, and third, to support sustainable rural development, not only uh, for our members, but uh, for our neighbors, the neighbor communities too, and others uh, interested. In this third area, we work together now for nine years with USAID, reaching about 18,000 families in different departments of uh, the East uh, Paraguay uh, uh, in, in East Paraguay. This project is called Inclusive Value Chains, and it is a really good project where we can give hope to people that uh, uh, are really in precarious uh, conditions. As FECOPROT, uh, I uh, work also uh, in the local Paraguay chapter of the Global Roundtable of Sustainable Beef, GRSP. Thank you. Alfred, uh, it sounds like cooperatives are integrated into all parts of your life and your community. I'm anxious to hear more later about, um, you know, how you work with locally led development, because it sounds like the cooperatives in your community are, are leading economic development. So thank you very much for your presentation. And now, uh, Claude, the same, the same question to you, your background and what you're currently engaged in. Good morning, everyone. Um, so just to be clear, I use the term financial cooperatives and credit unions interchangeably. And my experience has always been uh, really uh, financial cooperatives or credit unions. So I specialize in implementing USA's projects under EGAP. And most of that experience has always been centered around the property largely because the work has always hovered around the theme of financial inclusion. So I've been lucky to lead different types of EGAP projects for USAID, ranging from digital payment systems, management information systems, governance, cultural finance, housing finance, and equity finance. Most of the experience has been with the World Council, where I was their um, chief of project director for over 10 years. Uh, currently, I serve as a chief of party for the Athena project, um, that project is implemented by uh, We work in the supply side of MSME services, such as business advisory and financial services. Now, this work doesn't target credit unions explicitly. Um, however, I must note that um, because of their local nature, we rely heavily on financial cooperatives to reach underserved MSME communities. One thing I want you to know about financial cooperatives is that we can't get more local than that. 
Um, and he financial profit is a limited to one geographical department. Um, we cannot work in more. Um, this is a department is not in the U.S. state, but it's way smaller than the U.S. state. So you can think of the department of Haiti as a county. So small. Um, so that limited um, geographic spread makes your ties to your local community stronger. Part of the financial institution, identifies in banks. And that is extremely valuable when you're trying to mobilize resources with a local community. Haiti has had many issues uh, with some uh, large cooperatives who meddled and get rich fees. I'm not sure if anyone is aware of that. Uh, but back in 2001, we had a major scheme of financial cooperatives from a 10% monthly return. Um, we had more than $200 million uh, completely wiped out an unsound um, uh, or an illegal cooperative. Uh, in 2002, uh, Parliament passed a law that improved a regulatory framework and as of the end of the last fiscal year, the central bank of Haiti now regulates over 74 financial cooperatives representing over 224 million. That's a 1.2 million members. And um, globally, their, their return on assets is uh, a little over 5%, 5.04%. Return on equity. Uh, um, so financial properties are trustworthy, they're locally led, uh, they're democratic, um, and in a country like Haiti, they represent stability and endurance and a long way. Thank you, Claude, very much for that. Um, we're having a little hard time hearing you through your presentation, so while we go to the next panelist, maybe you could work on your microphone for us. So now we'd like to hear from our USAID colleagues. They will be coming on the screen in just a moment. Um, which one should uh, speak first? We have three people okay. from USAID. Yeah, okay, so thank you, um, uh, Marie Renee. So I have a question for our USAID colleagues. Uh, similar question, tell us a little bit about your background in your work, what sectors do you currently engage with, most cooperatives or credit unions? And how have you seen cooperatives impact the work you do? So uh, Marie Renee, would you like to start? Yes. Good morning. Yes, my name is Marie Renee Vertus. I've been at USAID Haiti for about 13 years. Um, I work in activities um, support. I, I work in activities that are try to deepen the financial sector, uh, and I mainly work with uh, financial cooperatives. So I've been working with, I've discovered financial cooperatives at USAID. I used to be a, a banker, so I was uh, not used to financial cooperatives. And at USAID, uh, I work with both banks and non-banks, um, uh, and I discovered uh, credit unions. So. Um, in uh, the credit unions that we work with, uh, the credit unions, they provide services to most sectors, but in Haiti, it's mostly commerce. Um, uh, that's, what, that's where the, I would say, the, the easiest way for uh, financial institution to go. But with the cooperatives, we try to support specific um, sectors like uh, agriculture and housing. Um, and yes, we've seen a lot of, of uh, I've seen I've seen impact uh, with the work with the cooperatives. Um, I could say uh, for the past ten years, the um, cooperative members of uh, of institutions that were supported by USA, the numbers grew from about two hundred thousand to a million. So I can say that cooperatives help bring uh, access to finance to people outside of Port-au-Prince, where it's uh, it was mostly limited, uh, over. Thank you very much. Uh, great experience here. I'm glad you found cooperatives. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, we wish more people would do that. And, and now on to the same question. Uh, Audrey, uh, please, please go ahead and, and uh, share with the, with the uh, participants. Thank you so much, Paul. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adriana Casati. 
Um, I am, uh, I work at USAID Paraguay. I'm the Program Resources and Performance Director for the mission here. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal story uh, with cooperatives. I grew up overseas um, from a very small age in different Latin American countries um, because my father worked for the Inter-American Development Bank um, and he actually started his career as an agricultural officer. So I already growing up, I, um, I grew up with a strong sense of the importance of development in general and rural development in particular. And my first exposure to cooperatives was actually through my grandfather. Um, my family and I visited Paraguay every summer and my grandfather, um, whom I adored, um, was a medical surgeon and, and he was a member, uh, he was a board member of a health professionals uh, financial cooperative in Paraguay. So when I moved back to Paraguay uh, to attend law school, I remember that the one thing that really struck me about Paraguayan culture was a strong sense of solidarity. Whenever there was somebody uh, sick in the community or somebody in need, um, Paraguayans would host these big gatherings. Um, they call them mingas, um, and the term is in Guarani. And these are fundraising events to support um, the, the community member in need. And, and I think the key word here is solidarity, because I think that's what cooperatives are all about. Um, cooperatives really have solidarity at their core. They are democratic in nature and they're market oriented, which makes them competitive and also efficient. And the, the other thing that I learned uh, upon my return to Paraguay was that Paraguay's development was actually largely based on cooperatives. Um, and the first, uh, and, and Paraguay has a long standing tradition of cooperatives, more than I've seen in, in other Latin American countries. And this tradition really began with Mennonite immigrants like Alfred and, and his family, um, who came to Paraguay in the early 1900s and settled in the Chaco, in the Paraguayan Chaco. This is one of the most remote and inhospitable um, regions of the country. It's a dry forest um, um, and had absolutely no infrastructure when, when uh, the Mennonites settled there. Um, and they use cooperatives as their growth and development model. The per capita income of uh, the Chaco region is now four times higher than Paraguay's average per capita income. And that's largely due to cooperatives in the region. So as I said, I am currently the uh, program and resources director at USA Paraguay, and I have been with AID for over 15 years. And the one project that I, that I would like to talk to you about is the same project Alfred Fast mentioned. We actually work very close together under that project, the Inclusive Value Chains Project. It is implemented by a local partner, the Federation of Producer Cooperatives, or FEC Abroad. Um, uh, Alfred is, is the president of the cooperative. They have 34 members, um, which are large and medium-sized cooperatives. And their goal is to strengthen the capacity of small agricultural producer associations to increase their productivity and access to resources and link them to anchor firms and markets. It turns out that a lot of the beneficiary organizations that we're working with are becoming, they, they started off as small associations, but they're now becoming, uh, they're formalizing and becoming small cooperatives. And it also turns out that many of the anchor firms under this value chain project um, just have so model of cooperatives helping cooperatives grow. Um, and just last week I was visiting, I think my connection might be a little bit unstable. Um, just last week I was visiting project sites from, uh, with colleagues from Washington. And I was so proud to see the work of this local implementing partner um, to support it, supporting small farmers, over 18,000 small farmers who were below the poverty line, but not anymore after eight or nine years working with FECOPROD, um, these agricultural producers have doubled their income. 12,000 agricultural producers have actually doubled their income. So when I think of cooperatives, I really think about locally led development. I truly believe that where there is a cooperative, there's an, op 
there's an opportunity for inclusive economic growth and sustainable democratic development. Thank you. Adriana, what a wonderful personal story and what a testament to the work that uh, the cooperatives in Paraguay are doing with the support of USAID. Uh, your, your point about uh, increased incomes is certainly matches up with the uh, research that OCDC and our International Cooperative Research Group have done uh, over the past several years. So thank you very much. Now we're gonna move back to the cooperative leaders for, an, for another question. Um, so the question is how have cooperatives or credit unions helped your members or uh, through difficult times and challenges? For example, uh, COVID or inflation or climate impacts. Uh, could you give us some examples of how the cooperatives have helped their members through their, these difficult times? So uh, let's start with uh, Alfred this time. I don't see Alfred on the screen, so perhaps we'll go to Claude. Okay. Um, here. Oh, oh, here's here's oh, Alfred. Hi. Okay, good. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, I want to talk about the recent situation we uh, uh, had this year in Paraguay. We have had the worst harvest uh, we remember in the last crop season because of a drought that affected especially uh, the soybean production and resulted in a reduction of 70% in the whole country. So. Uh, at the same time, uh, because of many reasons, the prices of production inputs like fertilizers escalated uh, rapidly. So we adopted different uh, measures uh, at the federation level, uh, at the cooperative level, and uh, as our agricultural department uh, departments in the local uh, cooperative level. Uh, as federation, we uh, talked uh, with other uh, entities, with the government. We passed them the situation. They, uh, they were aware of that. And so we, we could talk uh, with the Minister of Agriculture to uh, especially uh, encourage uh, the ministry uh, to assist small scale farmers that aren't able to work with financial institutions because of the loss in production and 25% uh, of our uh, soybean production is made by small scale farmers. Uh, we had to care for them because they are the most weak people in uh, these situations. Uh, we talked too to the treasury department to postpone the payment of certain anticipated taxes we have to pay in Paraguay. And we talked with the president of the central bank to lower the requirements for refinancing loans due to the draw. Uh, then we talked to, to the banks that are under the central bank uh, with the financial institutions to provide sufficient loans to uh, the different farmers with low interest rates because of this special situation of crisis. As cooperatives, we know our different farmers uh, who are members. So we try to uh, give them loans so they are able to continue to produce. And as uh, our agricultural departments and the local co-ops, we give them assistance to the farmers. And because we buy the products ahead in time and in a planned manner, we have a, a business uh, a, a named ECOP, where we buy uh, fertilizers and we buy uh, uh, two uh, gas and uh, uh, diesel and all that. Uh, so, so we sell them in, in gas stations, but uh, also we import uh, fertilizer. So as we do it in an economy of scale and ahead, we can provide production inputs at competitive and affordable prices to uh, all our members. Uh, this is uh, uh, work that uh, we are doing for 
now for uh, more than 10 years. And it is giving really good results because we, we can provide uh, inputs for our farmers that they uh, are needing right now uh, in the specially uh, uh, bad situation. So uh, as cooperatives, we can make a difference and we can help uh, at different levels uh, to uh, ensure that we can uh, produce uh, food in, in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, that's, that's a great example of a great story of meeting a challenge that, uh, that your members are experiencing. So Claude, on, back to you on, on how your credit unions help your members through times of crisis. Yeah, uh, Paul, if you don't mind, uh, can you hear me well now? Yes. I'd like to go back to the to the first question and give um, talk about my background a little bit for those who couldn't hear me. Um, so I'm a I, I'm a USAID implementer. Um, that's what I specialize in. I specialize in uh, USAID EGAP projects. Uh, but uh, I've been lucky enough to lead uh, many different types of um, EGAP activities, always centered around fin uh, financial cooperatives because the work that we've always done has been around financial inclusion. Um, so I've done worked in projects that have had to do with digital payment systems, MIS, governance, ag finance, housing finance, and SME finance. Most of that work has been done with, uh, with, with the World Council of Credit Unions in the past 10 years. Um, I was their COP and chief of party and country director for the past 10 years. Uh, currently, I serve as a chief of party for the ATTAIN project that is implemented by MEDA, which is Mennonite Economic Development Associates. Um, st very strong Mennonite connections among the panelists here. I'm not sure if it's <laughs> on purpose, but uh, definitely uh, I agree with the spirit of cooperative. Um, so we work on the supply side of MSME services, um, such as business advisory services and financial services. Um, the work that we do currently doesn't explicitly target credit unions. Um, however, I must note that because of their local nature, we rely heavily in financial cooperatives um, to reach underserved MSMEs in rural areas. One thing I want um, everyone to know about financial cooperatives is that you can't get more local than that. Um, in Haiti, um, uh, financial cooperatives are limited to one geographical department. And you can think of a, a department of Haiti as a US state, but it's much more smaller. So it could be the equivalent of a, of a, of a county. Um, so that limited geographic spread makes their ties to the local community stronger than other types of financial institutions, uh, such as MFIs and banks. And that is extremely valuable when you're trying to mobilize resources within local communities. Um, Haiti has had many issues um, with some of the large cooperatives um, in the past who have meddled with uh, get rich schemes. Uh, back in 2001, uh, we had a major scandal uh, with financial um, cooperatives prom promising 10% monthly returns. And that wiped out $200 million um, lost uh, completely for the, from these illegal cooperatives. Uh, in 2002, Parliament passed a law that imposed a regulatory framework on financial cooperatives. And as of the end of uh, the last fiscal year, the central bank now regulates over 74 financial cooperatives, representing $224 million in assets, 1.2 million members, uh, with a return on assets of a little over 5% and return on equity about 24%. Uh, financial cooperatives are trustworthy, locally led, and democratic. Um, in a country like Haiti, um, they represent stability and endurance, and that goes a long way. Uh, to talk about the shocks, um, Haiti gets a lot of shocks, uh, <laughs> and credit unions always, always represent a major safety net, largely because of their emphasis on savings. I remember back in 2010, immediately after the earthquake, we mobilized uh, 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 pretty quickly uh, to establish a stabilization fund for several MFIs and the Credit Union Federation. And while this met the world to our MFI partners, MFI microfinance institution partners, the Credit Union Federation came back to us and said, they could not make the case for the utilization of the stabilization fund because most credit unions had experienced a surge in savings and membership in the months following the earthquake. And we've seen that as being a trend uh, for many different uh, credit unions after these shocks, whether it be um, hurricane or earthquakes. Um, and I don't mean to embellish the situation. Um, I, I wouldn't place inflation in the same category of shocks as the others. Um, along with currency devaluation, inflation is a killer to credit unions. They remain highly fragile institutions, not be able to make long-term loans and large long-term transactions with their mortgages. Over. Thank you, Claude. Uh, your experience there when uh, 
people are uh, facing financial and economic uh, crisis. Uh, uh, focusing back on the credit union, certainly experience that we have around the world whenever there are similar type of situations. So thank you for that. And, and we can hear you loud and clear. That's great. Uh, let's go to Hazel now and your experience in the Philippines. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, for this question, I'd like to share three things. First, uh, I'd like to go back and share the history of my cooperative, SIDSI. So, Sarasoro Ibaba Development Cooperative actually came from a barangay or a small community here in the Philippines. It's actually uh, located in the uplands and SIDSI is actually it is uh, engaged highly in agriculture. So this is a very vulnerable sector in the Philippines, most especially because we frequently experience typhoons and um, a lot of uh, natural disasters every year. But uh, since during the time back in 1969, in its founding year, it was initiated by a farmer, Mr. Victoriano E. Barte together with 58 other founding members. And they pulled together around 200 pesos, or that's like roughly around $4 each uh, as initial share capital. Together, they pulled this money because they saw the need for uh, access to the market because they are located in uplands and the trading activities are far from them. So they have to do something about it. And so this is a cooperative. This is an association started by the farmers themselves. They pulled together their resources, formed small capitalization, and started a grocery store. Later on, with the growth of the members, with the support of the community, and um, they found that most of the members are into livestock and poultry, so they would be needing some um, feeds, and some are into farming, so they would be needing fertilizer and other farm inputs. And so the list goes on for the products and services developed by the cooperative. And later on, a feed mill was set up and then the rest is history. So the cooperative, our cooperative currently offers diversified business operations. And I think um, that uh, challenge during that time actually uh, gave uh, SIDSI its birth opportunity to where we are now. And then secondly, I'd like to go to another sharing. Back in 2019, um, when the Philippines started hearing uh, about the African swine fever, uh, the ASF, so there, we were alarmed because much of our uh, operations are into hog raising to livestock. So we have to make measures this will be affecting the operations. And then came 2020, in January 2020, the Taal volcano erupted. And this is where most of our operations are located. So there were a lot of things happening. And then later came March 2020. And that's when the time the, the Philippine government started imposing lockdowns. And so the pandemic, which was not actually part of our planning, of our risk management uh, assessment back then, was really shocking for, for the operation of, of of our cooperative. But even though this happened, this, um, this challenges happened, the cooperative was able to um, give uh, support to our members by uh, uh, having some reserve funds allocated for relief operations. So we were able to do relief operations right away, immediately after the volcanic eruption. And then we were able to distribute relief uh, to our members across the country during the pandemic, at the height of the pandemic. Even during that time, we were able to we were able to provide continuous support to them by um, having some innovations with our marketing. So we, are, we also offer um, retail business. And so during that time, we boosted our online presence. We did shift our membership to online also. We did home delivery services. We have rolling stores, um, traveling across communities so that we would be able to reach uh, the members, the our communities where CDC operates. So aside from that, we were able to um, improve the accessibility and availability of goods in the community. And of course, uh, there were uh, a lot of 
ad hoc committees, the formation of task forces, just to make sure that everything is in place and the business would not be uh, much much be disrupted. And of course, uh, the support for the employees as well, because um, we're in agriculture and we're mostly composed of the frontliners, especially those uh, in the stores. So uh, the cooperative was able to provide uh, enough transportation and support and while maintaining safety protocols, of course, during that time. So I think um, these are just uh, very challenging times that the cooperative was able to uh, went through and it made us stronger. And then lastly, if I could still share, um, we're currently uh, implementing the Grow Co-op project uh, under the USAID uh, funding. And we are working with a consortium of local resource organizations here in the Philippines. Um, we are um, together with Agriterra. Uh, they, they, they are an uh, international cooperative specialist also. And during that, uh, the conception stage of the project, the Grow Co-op project, we were thinking of uh, developing and helping the smaller cooperatives um, and we will be acting as their big brothers or big sisters as a local resource organization while providing them with uh, capacity building support and linking them to our value chain. So that in itself is assuring them of a market. So um, everything that will be given to them in the form of in the form of capacity building is like assuring that they will these cooperatives will be strengthened so that later on they will be more credible business partners. And even during the pandemic, we were challenged because uh, we were not able to implement the activity. So um, a lot of flights were not were cancelled. And so we have to think of an, of an innovation, of a pivot, of what we can uh, possibly offer of what or what we can do just to make sure that we will, we will be uh, still be able to deliver uh, to the farming communities where we, where we committed to make the project work. And so during that time, it's, it's still pandemic. We, uh, we, were, we were introduced with the agro-enterprise clustering model. I think it's not really a new model, but for us, it, uh, it, it actually worked. And we were able to um, successfully um, complete the value chain from the farmer, from the cluster organizing up to the test marketing. And currently we're running, uh, we're implementing the, we're implementing the clustering approach uh, and we're on our third batch already. So, so far we have formed 28 clusters in three regions here in the country. And uh, we, are, we were able to uh, counterpart as a cooperative, around 11 million uh, loan releases to our uh, farmer cooperative farmer members, and we were able to acquire um, one million kilos of yellow corn or maize from them. And so the purchase amounted to around 14 million pesos. So this all happened during the pandemic, and we were very thankful to USAID and Agriterra for their support on this. Uh, pivot and innovation that we are currently benefiting from. So uh, I think there's a lot of sharing on my end, right. but I really, really, really uh, happy to be able to, to share these things with you. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel, very much. Now we're going to go back to our uh, USAID colleagues. Uh, but for the audience, um, we're going to have time at the end for questions and uh, for the panelists. So. If you'd like to put questions into the Q&A, uh, we will hopefully get to those at, at the end. Uh, I'm going to change up the next question a little bit. We've, we've had several questions from the audience about the definition of localization. So I thought I'd ask our uh, USAID colleagues to, uh, from your perspective, uh, define what is meant by localization. And I'll just open it up to either one of you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Let me try to get started. Um, yes, we've heard the term localization um, uh, a few times already during the presentation. And localization is really a new approach um, defined by our administrator, Samantha Power. Um, and she has challenged uh, USAID 
operating units throughout the world to uh, to embrace localization. So what, what do we mean by localization? Um, localization is really about the fundamental belief that lo local stakeholders have the capacity and the will to identify their own development needs and to come up with their own solutions. All they need is just a little nudge from USAID and from other international donors. Um, and we really need to start seeing our role as, um, as international donors from a facilitator perspective. We need to become facilitators and catalysts of locally led development. Um, we Localization means uh, consulting, ample consultations with local stakeholders. It means engaging local stakeholders in the identification um, of needs in, in, in coming up with the problem statement. It means engaging local stakeholders and coming up with solutions to the identified problem. And it also means channeling resources, um, whether directly or indirectly through local partners. Um, Administrator Power has challenged us to channel 50% of the agency's resources um, indirectly, at least indirectly through local partners over the next years um, uh, and 25% um, and over the next 10 years. So, and, and that's a big challenge for, um, for many missions. At USAID Paraguay, we have been championing localization for a long time, partly because of limited resources, our bilateral budget is, is quite small, but also because of this fundamental belief that local stakeholders really do have the capacity to lead their own development. Um, and, and let me give you a, a, an example of that. Um, some eight years ago, when we, were, um, uh, when we uh, launched our request for applications, uh, for our inclusive value chains project, FECOPROD applied for funding. Um, FECOPROD was a strong, um, very well-known local organization, but they had never worked with USAID before, and they had very little experience working with international donors. And um, they had, they really uh, literally met every single, or, or almost every single definition under what USAID um, uh, now calls the New Partnerships Initiative, another approach uh, that USAID has taken on to engage new partners in the development world. Um, they were a new organization that had no experience working with USAID. They were local, they were underutilized. So all of the definitions under uh, the New Partnerships Initiative and, and, and what we now call uh, localization. And to be honest with you, we had our doubts. Um, they had a thorough understanding of Paraguay's rural context. They had a vested interest in, in the development of their communities. Um, and they came up with, and their approach was to come up with solutions based on empowering local stakeholders. So we took the risk. Um, and, uh, and that is something that risk adversity is something that we are trying to overcome at the agency. We took the risk and we modeled this project around um, FECOPROD and larger, wealthier, more established cooperatives helping smaller, more incipient associations and cooperatives grow and thrive. Um, and our main goal was to build long-term and mutually beneficial relationships between the smaller cooperatives and the larger cooperatives, um, where the, the, the larger cooperatives really um, play a role as anchor firms and mentors of the smaller cooperatives as, um, as Alfred was, was describing before. So the first thing FECOPROD set out to do was to strengthen the institutional capacity of these smaller associations and cooperatives by providing them with improved um, governance, um, requirements uh, we're helping them come up with their own improved governance requirements improving their accountability their financial management um, improving their transparency and also um, and also improving their negotiation and their and their leadership skills then uh, we set out to improve the productivity of the members of the cooperative but not by working with the members themselves but by working through the cooperative so we strengthen their, their small ag cooperatives so that they would in turn be able to provide capacity 
um, development services and, and productivity services to their members. And after the organizations were, were strengthened and productivity um, and, and quality was increased, so competitiveness was increased, we set them up with anchor firms um, in the market. And after nine years, it is the anchor firms and the larger cooperatives are, that are now providing technical assistance to the smaller cooperatives. And the smaller cooperatives are not just um, have gone from mere collection centers that sell their products to the larger cooperatives to really some of them also becoming um, diversifying their, their production, industrializing their production. So one dairy cooperative, for instance, who used to just sell milk to a larger cooperative is now making um, cheese and yogurt and ice cream. They're becoming more formal and, um, and, and, and they're uh, attempting to get all the certificates they need to participate in public tenders. So that's really what local development is all about. And that's what localization is about. It's about trusting stakeholders, um, local stakeholders to define their own path to development. And um, in this sense, to once again emphasize that, uh, that I do believe that cooperatives are great drivers of local development uh, because, they're, because they're built on the principles of solidarity, accountability, like Claude was just telling us, trust, they do have the capacity to impact long-term and long-lasting democratic development in their communities. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Good, good, good explanation. We appreciate that. Uh, Marie, Renee, um, your thoughts on localization and maybe an example from uh, your work. Yes, um, I think Adriana really gave a good overview of what it is. But what I can say is that I joined U.S. about 13 years ago and I came from the private sector. And um, so it wasn't hard for me uh, to be that the activities that I uh, help uh, either design or implement to go talk to stakeholders, to local actors, not to say, we're going to design for you and you gun. So uh, we've been from the get go, uh, the idea was to deepen the financial sector, to bring access to services like savings and credit, basic financial services to people who didn't, who could not who uh, the formal financial institution would not go there because of cost or whatever. So what we did was really as examples, working with local actors in the financial sector. So we were not about, oh, let's create, you know, temporary organization to provide services. Then after the activity is done, that's it. No, we work with local actors to strengthen them. But what we did also as an example with the credit unions, rather than trying to work with one or two, we work with uh, through uh, networks, networks of credit union, uh, associations of credit unions to provide, you know, on a, how would I say that, on a consolidated basis, uh, the help that they, they, they needed. So for example, uh, as a matter of fact, I worked a lot with Claude. Now, most of the activities that I manage were implemented uh, by Claude. Uh, so we work with credit unions. Um, so what I can say uh, as examples, for, um, about 10 years ago when USAID started talking to the credit union, uh, maybe 12 years ago, and they said, we think we need ag financing in our communities. Um, so we help develop, we help them uh, develop products, ag finance products, help them market these products and help them manage these products. So now, um, for example, it was when they started doing this, it was mainly the credit union doing this. But then we were surprised to see that other financial institutions uh, were interested into looking at ag finance. So that's an example of the impact that credit unions had in their communities. Credit unions also, they are like the engine of uh, development in their communities. If you go to a community and you say, where's the bank? they take you to the credit union. This is their bank and they are proud of it. And really without them, financial services would not have reached people in these areas, you know? Maybe because in Haiti microfinance up to maybe a year ago, they would not accept deposit. They could not accept deposit. So even if you're a microfinance member, you could not have access to savings. Whereas with the credit union, the people had access to savings, uh, transfers, they could do um, exchange uh, rate uh, um, operations. So that's really, I think I really discovered 
the credit union at USA. And I, I could say that without the credit unions, um, a lot of places in Haiti would be left behind. There is a lot of work to do, but they have opened up the way for basic access to uh, financial services in rural areas in Haiti. Over. Thank you, uh, Marie, Renee, very much. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we're gonna go right now to our lightning round, uh, where we're gonna give each of the panelists one minute to answer this question. What is one thing you would want everyone to know about cooperatives? And I'm gonna start with Claude. Okay. Um, I want everyone to know, what everyone to know that is that credit unions are perhaps one of the most effective entry points into rural communities. They are very open and are aware of local challenges and trends. However, that quality can also be a weakness. Their openness sometimes tends to allow outside actors, such as NGOs, to distort the nature of their operations or engage in activities that are not financially viable in the long term. This is something that I've seen quite a lot in post-shock situations. So that is something that we all need to be aware of. I mean, when you're working within a bilateral context, such as a USAID programming, the mission plays a, a central role in overseeing what its partners and contractors are doing with credit unions at any given time. And I know that this is something that Mary Rene Veltus within the USAID Haiti mission does very well in terms of overseeing what partners are doing. However, once you start having independent actors that are outside of the reach of bilateral partners, such as USCID, GAC, or AFD, things can take a wrong turn and become distorted and counterproductive. So I think that this is something that we all need to be mindful of. Let's not push credit unions to the brink. One very common thing in our sector is that we always try to, you know, to bring the next big thing, some the, the, what, what is new and what is novel. Um, we get financial cooperatives engaged in things that are not their role because they are usually the beacon of stability and structure within their local communities, there's always a tendency to get them involved in other things such as health services, local governance initiatives, conflict resolution, and I've seen it all. There's usually, um, they are typically, there's, they are always proud to work with international partners, hence their openness. And there's a sense of competition among financial cooperatives um, and who has the best relationship with donors. So that openness, um, can also be uh, uh, very dangerous and we need to act responsibly. And when we see things that are not right, we need to come out and say it publicly. Um, you know, credit unions are a reflection of their membership and their local communities. Once you start to get a disconnect um, with these two, once you start to become too sophisticated um, and away from, the, from, from their local community and their membership, this is when things uh, start getting distorted. So I'd be very careful about that. So then that's the message I want to send to everyone today. Thank you, Claude. Um, Marie Renee, uh, one minute. What would you like people to know about cooperatives? Uh, well, I would like people to know that cooperatives are committed to improve the lives of their of people in their communities, uh, and also on the financial cooperatives, which are the ones that I I know about, are more. Um, they are willing to invest, whereas other financial institutions are not that interested into bringing more services. You see um, them, they are open. What drives them is the improvement in the lives of their members. So they are committed to invest or to look for the investment that would need help them uh, service their members. Uh, over. Thank you. Uh, Hazel? Yes. Well, uh the sharing of Mary Irene is very beautiful. But for me, I, I think I can share that um, cooperative is, in the words of our CEO, he's telling that the cooperative is the most amazing and beautiful type of organization because anyone can join. It's open and voluntary and inclusive development is really at it because cooperatives help people help themselves. We have, um, we develop businesses, we provide these businesses to our members because this is what they need. This is coming from them. And so we are able to encourage them with their active participation. We, we have a high engagement with them because this is what they are telling us that we have to do. And so when the members are engaged, when this 
needs are coming from them, the resources are easily accessed and we're able to implement um, businesses and projects easier because it's what the members demand from us. And I think another thing is that it's very important to maintain transparency and cooperative and to make sure that uh, a, bit, a cooperative is successful. There has to be a very good leadership and governance. There has to be a very focused management and a viable business at hand. And equally important is the active members' participation, participation and engagement. Just to be able to show that um, cooperative would really work well. So I think that's it, uh, Paul. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Hazel. Andreana? Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. So to me, cooperatives are really about people that come together under a common goal. Um, and that common goal is to support each other and, and allow each other to grow collectively. Um, I also think of cooperatives as the intersection between private sector and civil society. They are built on the values uh, of common good and solidarity, like most civil society um, organizations, but they must thrive in competitive markets, which forces, be to, which forces them to be efficient and resourceful and innovative like private sector companies. So they're, they're really at that crossroads uh, between private sector and civil society. Cooperatives are also democratic and self-accountable organizations that function like growth poles in the areas where they, where they work. Um, they really are at the heart of sustainable locally led development. Thank you. And Alfred. Yeah, uh, for me, people and persons are the most important capital and we must, uh, and uh, these uh, people must be empowered and encouraged to reach their goals working together in a group. Unity is uh, a strength of the cooperative system, but there can be no unity without trust and individual responsibility because without trust, it's impossible to work uh, together in any organization. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, we must uh, have the approach of bottom-up development, not top-down. It's impossible uh, for the government to uh, establish cooperatives because only the people on the ground, uh, if they have uh, interest and if they uh, want to do it, it will succeed. And if people can achieve their own goals in a group, they are proud of that. Uh, they are proud of what they can do, and it gives people dignity. I think uh, the great success of cooperatives is uh, that there was democracy all the time. No, uh, regardless uh, of the system of government we had in different countries, democratic elections were held in cooperative. Within the cooperatives, the foundations were created for a development that arises from the needs of the members and seeks to provide economic and social solutions to the problems of individuals who at the same time retain their independence and individual freedom, but work together to achieve common goals. Uh, this explains the extraordinary, uh, extraordinary growth in GDP per capita of the cooperative members compared to the population that works without uh, these principles of cooperation beside. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we're um, uh, gonna move into questions from the audience now. We're getting lots of questions. And if, if people in the audience have questions, please put those in the Q&A and we'll hopefully get to them. Um, and my first question here comes from the audience and probably this is for Alfred and Hazel. Uh, have cooperatives been found organically in some societies or do they have to be created or identified by some formal institution? Alfred, you're on yeah. mute. Yeah. Uh, so for me, cooperatives uh, need to grow from the ground. 
bottom up, not top down. Uh, it's impossible to create cooperatives uh, by law because uh, you need to work with people. Uh, people must map together. They need to be uh, empowered. They need to help themselves. They need to have self-government and uh, they need to be uh, responsible for what they do. And uh, in a group, they will achieve many things, but it can't be created uh, top down. Uh, I think uh, Adriana already talked about that, uh, the local approach to, to see what are the needs of the people and and that's why cooperatives are so uh, efficient because uh, the, the board of the cooperatives, they need to do what their people, their members are uh, looking for to do. So, so they need to create solutions to the problems uh, and these problems can be economic or social or cultural and, and uh, if the board doesn't do that, they won't be re-elected. So uh, that's how it works in the cooperatives. Great, great, Alfred. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to move on to another question. Um, and this is, this is for all the panelists. I'm not sure who could answer this. But um, is there any research that studies whether cooperatives have impact in other dimensions, such as health, education, or equity? So what are, the, what are the other benefits other than economic ones uh, for, from cooperatives? And do we have studies that back that up? I'll open it up to see if anybody would like to comment on that. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toot the OCDC <laughs> horn a little bit here. I'll, just a second. If you go to our website, uh, We've just completed at the International Cooperative Research Group a number of studies that uh, get, uh, have data that uh, outline some of the other uh, benefits from cooperatives. And you can do, find that at ocdc.coop.coop. Andriana? Yes, thank you, Paul. I, I don't know about studies, but I can speak um, about my own personal experience. I mentioned um, earlier that uh, my first exposure to cooperatives was through my grandfather, um, who, who was a member of the board of a cooperative set up by health professionals in Paraguay, doctors and nurses um, uh, came together for this cooperative. Um, aside from offering financial services, um, they do offer some um, uh, training uh, sessions and health sector training sessions, but most importantly, they also offer um, health insurance services, um, the, the cooperative does. And so it's a longstanding cooperative. It has, um, uh, I don't know, 50, 70 years in the market. Um, and they're one of the strongest, uh, they're the strongest health sector cooperative in Paraguay. So to answer your question, yes, um, cooperatives, I think can, um, can people can come together around a common goal and a common theme and form cooperatives because cooperatives are, are just about people coming together, um, putting in some kind of resource towards a common goal. So the answer I think is yes, thank you. So another question uh, regarding localization, and Andriana, you mentioned this, uh, when the co-ops in Paraguay applied for funding, they didn't have any experience uh, with USAID and perhaps uh, other government funding. Could, could folks both from the co-ops and from USAID comment on what a, how would a, a local cooperative get themselves in a position to apply for funding? What do they need to have in place? Can I turn the question over to us, Paul? Um, sure. I, I don't think it's about what the cooperatives should have in place. I think it's about what the agency needs to do to engage a wider audience um, as implementing partners. And that's what we've been doing at USAID Paraguay. 
Um, it's really about what mechanisms do we as an agency have to embrace risk management in the understanding that um, that it's that it's actually more cost efficient um, and it's more sustainable in the long term to engage with local partners. So as, as I mentioned before, we were a little bit wary at first. Um, we were gonna work with this large federation of producer cooperatives, um, strong, but no experience working with aid, um, but we bet on them. And the project turned out to be uh, extremely successful. Um, as a result of the project, FECOPROD is now also engaging with other donors, including um, JICA, the Japanese Development Agency and others. Um, and they have said, uh, um, they have formed the basis of a new rural development model in Paraguay that was actually included um, in the World Bank um, uh, Agricultural Development Strategy for Paraguay and, and their new strategy. So, so people are learning from lessons learned under this model. The model. It's not about what cooperatives can do. Um, they can most certainly improve their accountability, their financial management, um, learn the regulations, but it's really about what USAID and other donors can do to engage local partners and embrace that risk. Here's a question um, from the audience. Uh, what type of cooperatives seem to be the most successful? Hazel, could you comment on that? Yes, Paul. Um, I think it would vary depending on where where the cooperative is located. But specifically for the Philippines, most of the cooperatives driving here are the credit cooperatives. Only a few are from the agri sector, like like us. So uh, probably because uh, it would really depend on the need on the needs of the community. Because cooperatives, as Alfred has was saying, is that this is. This is an organization made by the people for the people. So it, it really would uh, vary depending on uh, the needs of the community. And it would depend on who is forming the organization and what it is intended for. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Um, Kind of a follow-up question to that. What are some of the biggest challenges that cooperatives are facing in today's market? Alfred, uh, Claude, any thoughts? I think in the, in the case of Haiti at least, uh, I think the biggest challenge is currency devaluation. Um, and I think cooperatives don't know how to deal with that. I think luckily in Haiti, out of this, I talked earlier about the 74 cooperatives that are regulated by the central bank. Um, I think that they depend a lot on, on, on learning from the regulator um, to understand how they can counter that. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, they're a reflection of the communities. And as long as these communities face these shocks, um, um, such as, you know, rampant inflation, um, I think they're, they're, they're always have that risk. And I think they need to, I think uh, the, the reliance and savings and mobilization. So that's been the most work that we do with them is um, uh, emphasizing on the savings. Uh, but I think, yeah, currency devaluation is perhaps the, um, the NHD is, is, is one of the biggest issues that they face. Um, I would like to uh, follow up on what Claude is saying. I think one of the biggest challenges is uh, managing their growth. Some of them are expanding, and now they get into the issues of governance, of vision, of strategy. You see, so it's not inflation, yes, currency and depreciation, yes, but if you have the governance, the vision, you can manage this. The issue is that they have grown, and now they are getting in, into um, larger issues, and they don't know how to, um, to react. I think we have an issue with governance. You know, they, they were when it's small, they can handle it, but when they start growing, then they start having issues. So uh, I think one of the big biggest uh, challenges that they have right now is an issue of governance, because as you know, board members are voluntary, they come from the community. So the small communities do not have uh, people who have the experience to help them uh, um, grow. That's, that's one of the main issues is uh, managing their growth, you know, in, uh, particularly in terms of governance. Hazel, oh, I see I you have your hand up. 
Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting question. Uh, for me, another challenge would be, aside from the governance side, is actually how more cooperatives want to be uh, on, this, on the level of uh, reaching economies of scale. Because there are a lot of cooperatives, even the smaller cooperatives who are just starting and wanting to grow big. But it's very difficult because their capacity is not yet ready. Like what Maria Rene is saying on their governance, if they're not prepared and they receive like a support from, from a donor and they're not able to implement it, then um, it's just uh, like wasting some resources. So uh, one challenge I think is how to, to be able to reach more communities, more um, like in our case, how to reach more farming communities while establishing economies of scale. And that itself is very difficult to, to achieve if you're just starting to go up. So it's very important that um, move, uh, people would be looking at how they will be benefiting more and how can they give more as part of the cooperative. Thanks, Hazel. Uh, a question about youth. Uh, can any of the panel highlight some lessons learned in terms of welcoming and empowering youth in cooperatives? Ralphud? Yeah, that is a really good question because uh, uh, we need to follow our principles in the cooperatives. We need to empower people. And as we need to empower people, we need to focus on uh, uh, transition and uh, we can only have a good and uh, good transition if we uh, have young people uh, coming into our cooperatives. So I think this, this is a really good approach. We uh, try to, uh, like in schools, private schools, we try to uh, uh, talk about cooperatives so that uh, young uh, people can know what it is about cooperatives and we invite them to, to work together in, in some groups in the cooperatives so they can uh, grow into responsibility. Uh, I, I think uh, this will be the transition will be a, a, a uh, great factor for uh, continuation of cooperatives. And two, uh, we need to uh, stay with our principles, but we need to be open to changes like uh, economy of scale and other things. And we need to deal with that to modernize uh, our cooperatives uh, as there is a need. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, Hazel, I see you have your hand up. Uh, I'd like to share in our cooperative, we're doing succession planning, and I'm actually very happy to be invited by Jay from USA Philippines, because I'm actually the youngest manager of our cooperative right now. I'm only 27, by the way, so this is really an honor to be part of the management team at the young age, and um, the cooperative's giving opportunity to younger generation and women like me is uh, very uh, interesting on my end, because cooperatives, especially in the Philippines, is not really an attractive organization to be part of it. So um, it's very challenging to be able to encourage the youth, but to, we do aggressive efforts on how we can be able to encourage them, like opening a um, savings account, encouraging the family members uh, of our members to, to engage their children in farming. So it's really about how we develop uh, promotions for them uh, over fault. Okay, thank you. Here's another question. In relying on cooperatives for localization, are there any challenges to ensure inclusion of marginalized groups? How do you ensure that cooperatives aren't excluding sexual and gender minorities in the population? I'll open that up to uh, anyone. How do we reach mar marginalized groups? Um, let me try to, uh, if I may, I think the way we include, we ensure that cooperatives are not marginalizing um, uh, already marginalized groups is the same way we do in any other project and any other sphere, really. Um, by definition, oftentimes cooperatives already engage marginalized groups. 
Um, uh, they work with people under, under the poverty line, for instance. And so they're already inclusive in their own, um, uh, at their core. Um, and like any other thing in society, you work with them to understand um, that inclusion is one of the most important aspects of development. So I think uh, cooperatives are, not, are no different than any other community um, or, or grassroots organization or, or local level organization when it comes to inclusion. But I think they, they oftentimes have a natural tendency um, towards inclusion because of the very essence of, of, that, of how they come to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claude? Uh, yes, uh, so I, I'm going to link that question. I think there's a question in the chat from Ms. Uh, Mark and Zach around how to reduce over-dependency on donors. I think these questions go together. Um, I think exclusion is such a big deal in Haiti that oftentimes uh, even high potential uh, 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 enterprises or the, uh, uh, businesses are excluded. So our work at USAID, when we talk about financial inclusion, is mobilizing that private capital from, uh, from the financial sector into these untapped markets. Um, ag finance in Haiti um, is new. It didn't exist before 2011. Um, so we're, our work has always been to um, uh, use incentives to evangelize credit unions and or the financial sector um, to reach out to these new markets. So it's always about only making sure, yes, we're reaching the marginalized, but also we have to make sure that there's a, there's a market value in reaching the marginalized. Um, we never uh, finance uh, credit portfolios. Uh, we only use incentives. We can have a different uh, presentation about this. Uh, the tool that we use is called Pave Performance, whereas we make sure that um, it's the capital of the credit union uh, who's driving the activity and they're only incentivized uh, to de-risk or to increase their appetite or to cover the cost of working with that, uh, with that, uh, with that new market. Um, in our experience, once we've been able to make the case uh, that these markets have a high potential, once we leave, um, yeah, they, they continue, activities tends to grow. Um, I mean, we've witnessed, you know, uh, I managed a project that, that ended in 2015 uh, that started Act Finance along uh, with USCID, along with GAC and Desjardins and Development International. And we saw the Act Finance portfolio growing and growing and growing. And a lot of that is because we, as USCID, were never in a drive, uh, the driver's seats. Um, and, and we always uh, make sure that the drivers of that activity were the, were, was the credit union um, themselves who were making these investments. And once it became evangelized, um, uh, they, they continued on doing that. So that's one way of uh, reducing dependency. But um, depending on the scale of exclusion, a lot of times you have people that are excluded that should not be excluded. Thank you, Claude. Uh, here's another question. The enabling environment for cooperatives, so laws and regulations and access to finance, uh, education, that's all very important to ensure that cooperatives uh, and their localization efforts thrive. What are your thoughts on the enabling environment for cooperatives in your country, and how has USAID tackled that? How has USAID been supportive of the enabling, enabling environment? Um, I sense that, oh, go, go, yes, go ahead, please. Yes. So in Haiti, uh, we've worked a lot with the central bank and also um, network and association in the enabling environment to provide, you know, the elements that would help uh, the cooperative grow. So, for example, USAID has uh, helped from the get go. Uh, the central bank to supervise financial cooperatives because, as Claude had mentioned, 15 years ago there was a big, you know. I don't know what word to use, but it was a, a catastrophe with uh, non-regularized, non-supervised uh, credit unions. But then since then, the Central Bank of Haiti has stepped in and USAID and other donors have supported their effort. For example, right now there is the, I know that the World Bank has been uh, uh, pushing for uh, countries to have their own financial inclusion strategy and they help in Haiti. So through that strategy, there is more closer supervision and also not only supervision, but uh, strengthening of uh, the capacity of credit union. 
So that's one way of helping the enabling environment is going through the regulator and also going to networks and association to reinforce their capacity. Over. Very good. Thank you, Marie Renee. Uh, we just have a, a couple of minutes left uh, in the program. So um, I want to thank the panelists for their fantastic presentations today and, um, uh, and, and encourage people if you have questions, uh, more questions that you would like to contact OCDC, you can send us an email at uh, info at OCDC.coop. Here are some links to some uh, resources that have been mentioned today uh, and, and our uh, email address, as I mentioned. Uh, in the next slide, uh, there's several events coming up. Um, Saturday is the International Day of Cooperatives sponsored by the United Nations. It's the 100th anniversary of this celebration. And there are events all over the world. And so hopefully you, you'll find an event uh, in your community where you can participate. Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, Look at, for social media to see many wonderful stories about cooperatives. And on October 5th and 6th, uh, OCDC and the NCBA CLUSA are sponsoring a cooperative impact conference here in Washington, DC. Uh, there will be virtual aspects of that so you can participate from around the world. So please uh, be on the lookout for registration materials that will be coming out soon about that event. Uh, once again, I wanna thank USAID uh, and Market Links for this opportunity. Um, and our panelists again, let's give them a round of applause for all their presentations today and, and for many people getting up early or staying up late uh, in order to participate. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you, everyone. What a great webinar today. And lots of great links were shared. So please be sure to check it out, as well as the International Day of Cooperatives and all the great resources on the OCDC website. Um, if you do have any questions, um, again, and we uh, collected all the great questions in the chat. Sorry, we were not able to get to all of them, but um, this webinar will be posted on the Market Links website. And again, thank you so much to all of our panelists and our moderator for today's great session. We hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the day or evening. Take care.